Good morning again, everyone. Thanks for coming to today's Grand Rounds. I'll be giving an update on tricuspid regurgitation, specifically trying to focus on evaluation and management. I have no disclosures, but I'll be talking about off-label use and investigation or devices. Our goals for today are to understand the burden of tricuspid regurgitation, outline how to evaluate a patient with TR, and outline transcatheter therapy options. So we know that tricuspid regurgitation can either be primary due to a disorder of the leaflets or the subvalvular apparatus or secondary due to tricuspid annular changes in response to changes in the right ventricle. Isolated tricuspid regurgitation refers to tricuspid regurgitation that is specifically due to annular changes that are in response to changes in the right atrium. It tends to happen with atrial fibrillation. This um, echocardiographic based study from um, Madrid and Spain um, looked at about 35,000 echocardiograms and found about 22% of them had tricuspid regurgitation. The commonest cause of tri primary tricuspid regurgitation in this era is actually due to implantable device leads. And for secondary tricuspid regurgitation remains due to left-sided valvular heart disease. Closer to home, the Olmsted County looked at, about, um, looked at echocardiograms spanning about 10 years and found that about 417 patients had at least moderate tricuspid regurgitation. And in that cohort, the commonest cause was left-sided valve disease followed by pulmonary hypertension. As far back as a decade ago on the slide on the left, we knew that tricuspid regurgitation when it was present impacted survival. And this was from a v California VA-based study that consisted predominantly of men. In the middle slide, this was a, a Mayo Clinic review of 13,000 patients over 10 years of patients who had heart failure with ejection fraction of about 50% or less. 88% of these people had functional tricuspid regurgitation and when it was present, in addition to impacting survival, was associated with mod dyspnea, impaired renal function, and low cardiac output. And in the isolated tricuspid regurgitation cohort from the Olmsted County, the presence of even isolated tricuspid regurgitation, which only occurred about 8% of cases, was associated with reduced survival when compared to age and gender ma uh, matched controls. Now, even after we have successfully performed transcatheter valve interventions on the left-sided heart valves, the presence of tricuspid regurgitation attenuates the benefits from this. These two slides are from reviews of the SDS database, and on the left, it found that the presence of tricuspid regurgitation actually had a significant impact on 12-month mortality, as we can see on the slide on the left, and the one on the right actually echoes similar findings for um, tricuspid regurgitation after mitral clips. The impact of tricuspid regurgitation on mortality persists even after you've adjusted for things that tend to be associated with tricuspid regurgitation, i.e. right ventricular, left ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, or atrial fibrillation, and mitral regurgitation. This was from a pooled analysis of about 32,000 patients of all studies that reported outcomes for tricuspid regurgitation. From this, basically, it's, this was derived from population-based study and um, CMR, CMS database, and it's estimated that at least 1.6 million people are living with tricuspid regurgitation, and less than 0.5% of them are getting any therapies. So most of tricuspid regurgitation is secondary, and this is either due to left-sided heart disease or due to pulmonary hypertension. When this happens, this leads to pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension, which then through afterload changes, afterload, its afterload impact on the right ventricle will cause tricuspid valve annular dilation. Alternatively, the left-sided heart disease could cause changes in the left atrium that leads to atrial fibrillation, which through its impact on the right atria, leads to tricuspid valve annular dilation. Now, irrespective of the etiology of tricuspid regurgitation, the first thing that happens is right atrial volume overload. The right ventricle then tries to dilate to try to accommodate this increased volume at a lower pressure. If the insult continues, the next step is going to be tricuspid valve annular dilation. And with that, there's loss of leaflet coaptation, leaflet tethering, and this vicious cycle of tricuspid regurgitation be getting more tricuspid regurgitation. If this is still not addressed, then the next step is going to be right RV volume overload, and then the right ventricle also remodels to try to accommodate this. 
This then leads to reduced cardiac outputs and the chronic neurohumeral activation that leads to the congestion and the heart failure symptoms that we're familiar with. Tricuspid regurgitation tends to have a prolonged asymptomatic interval. Now, even when there are symptoms, it tends to be very subtle. And at this point, tricuspid regurgitation is predominantly an imaging diagnosis made for the most part on echocardiogram. By the time we start seeing end organ damage that is associated with right-sided heart failure, those are the symptoms that the patient may end up with, and that suggests that the disease is actually advanced at this time. The goals of imaging, echocardiogram, or cross-sectional imaging are to make a diagnosis to ascertain severity, look for the etiology of the tricuspid regurgitation, evaluate for concomitant lesions that help with planning treatment, look for right-sided chamber remodeling changes, assess for pulmonary hypertension, and to plan interventions. So echocardiogram is usually the first step, um, specifically a TTE, but the evaluation of the right ventricle can be challenging with this imaging modality. The right ventricle is crescentic, and we can see from the schematic that depending on the probe angulation, the right ventricular chamber size will be very different. And also, it's the plane as we should catch a tricuspid valve would also be different. But be that as it may, that's the first step. Now, the ASC guidelines recommends that we use multiple parameters to quantify any regurgitant lesion, and that includes the tricuspid valve. There are certain parameters that are either qualitative, semi-quantitative, or quantitative. But we know that for the most part, for practical purposes, we just look at the jet area, but that is fraught with difficulties. Because when you're using the jet area method, what you're trying to do is estimate how much of the color regurgitant flow there is in, in relation to the right atrium. And if there's severe tricuspid regurgitation, the right atrium is enlarged. So by, by rule of proportion, that is going to appear smaller than it is. And again, the regurgitant jet is dependent on the momentum of flow from the right ventricle to the right atrium, which is affected by multiple different things that includes the right ventricular um, function and as well as the relative um, pressure differences between both chambers. So if we look at these three echocardiograms on the left, that's clearly mild tricuspid regurgitation. On the right, that's clearly severe or more tricuspid regurgitation because there's right-sided chamber dilation. But if we look at the one in the middle here, just by color jet area, I'm not sure why that's not playing. Just by color jet, sorry, just give me one second now. Okay. I'm not sure why that's not playing, but believe me when I say by color jet area, it looks like it's moderate. And we can see that up there in those pictures. But well, the next step will be to try to use quantitative methods. But be that as it may, despite multiple probe angulations, it was difficult to get a flow convergence to do a, a PISA calculation, a vena contractor calculation in this patient. But from the low, lower right slide, we can see that there's um, IVC dilation. And that, that, those are some of the things that suggest that there is more likely um, elevated right atrial pressure. If we take it a step further and look at the Doppler of the TR jet that looks dense with a slightly pointed tip, the right atrium looks dilated and there is systolic reversal of the hepatic vein flow. So putting all of that together, the patient has criteria that is either can be mild, moderate, or severe based off of the ASC guidelines. And even the guidelines recognize that this is a challenge that happens in practice for in daily practice. So the different ways to try to break this tie is either using a 3 dte probe, as was done in this case, or to use cross-sectional imaging, which we'll talk about. So for this same patient with 3 dte probes, we're better able to define a flow convergence, get a PISA, and ascertain that this was actually severe tricuspid regurgitation. But additionally, this helped to determine that the cause of this tricuspid regurgitation was due to restriction of the atrial um, septum the anterior leaflet by a um, device lead. So there's this proposed grading scheme is not, not new anymore, but the thought process behind this is that it took the previously known three grades, um, three scale um, TR grade and then expanded it to five. And the thought is that the severe grade was actually a really heterogeneous group of patients who had varying degrees of RV dysfunction. And subclassifying that was better able to allow us to detect small ch changes 
in our therapies that would impact outcomes or restratify patients so that they can earlier get treatment. So a group in Europe took about 249 patients who had severe tricuspid regurgitation and used the new um, grading scheme. And with that, they actually found that there was a survival difference between the current severe and massive tricuspid regurgitation based off of this grading scheme. They also found there were differences in heart failure hospitalization as well. So in addition to TR quantification, the other things to look at on um, imaging will be the size of the annulus. It's difficult to have a dilated annulus and just have less than severe tricuspid regurgitation. It also, this is supposed to be an indication for therapies on the tricuspid valve at the time of left-sided valve surgery because we know that if there's tricuspid and that dilation, the tricuspid regurgitation is most likely going to progress. The, pres the abnormalities in the leaflet are the loss of coaptation or significant tethering is difficult to have that with less than severe tricuspid regurgitation, and those are also important parameters for planning treatment. Right-sided chamber, function and size is helpful for risk stratification as well. So, so if, from the image on the left, that was somebody who underwent, who already had moderate tricuspid regurgitation, underwent surgical mitral valve replacement, and then a TAVA, but still wasn't feeling well. And that's what her tricuspid valve looks like. But as we can see from that picture, the coaptation gap is way too large, and she is not a candidate for um, Coop, any um, therapy that involves um, trying to enhance coaptation for us. The other things are evaluate, evaluating the degree of tethering because from surgical literature, the more tethered the leaflets are, the less likely they're going to be suitable for only um, annuloplasty ring repair, which is the predominant um, inter surgical intervention for tricuspid valve. Cross-sectional imaging with the cardiac CT can help with quantification and assessment of volumes. It also gives information with um, quantification with an anatomical regurgitant orifice area, which tends to be slightly higher than an effective regurgitant orifice area. You can also measure tethering with CT and take a good look at the annulus itself. These endoluminal views are helpful because it gives you a better visualization of the leaflets, which due to the fact that the leaflets are thin and far away from a TEE probe may be difficult to visualize on um, transesophageal echo. Pro angles for procedures similar to TAVR can be obtained. And CTA is also very helpful to assess for neighboring structures when we are planning some form of, of transcatheter repair, which we'll go over. We can use this to follow patients to assess for durability of repair and for RV reverse remodeling in the right side at chambers. Cardiac MRI is also helpful for not just for assessing tricuspid regurgitation, but it's also useful for assessing right chamber volumes. And you can quantify tricuspid regurgitation with um, cardiac MRI. The additional benefits of this is that it can be done in the presence of a device lead. And for this measurement, gadolinium is not required, which is helpful in these patients who tend to have associated renal dysfunction. There are survival um, benefits to quantifying. A patient who has EROA greater for 40 or more has been reported to have reduced survival. Primary or isolated tricuspid regurgitation has the best survival of the different etiologies, and right ventricular dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension, irrespective of severity, is associated with reduced outcomes in these patients. Right ventricular ejection fraction of less than 46% in this CMR study has been found to portend increase, has been found to portend decreased survival and increased cardiac event rates and statistically significant. This was just a cohort of about 75 patients though. So I like this quote from my virtual attendance of PCR London valves last year, and it's attributed to Professor Zamorano. He's one of the people who is uh, changing the way we think about tricuspid regurgitation. And he states that treating tricuspid regurgitation and right-sided heart failure is an art rather than evidence-based medicine. I'd like to paraphrase that to say that TR is actually as much a team sport as it is an art and a science. We are all not unfamiliar with the concept of the heart valve team, but specifically for tricuspid regurgitation, as I mentioned, a lot of the patients have tricuspid regurgitation related to the device lead and also have a lot of arrhythmias that 
will impact that tricuspid regurgitation and it's important to collaborate with our electrophysiologist. Also, in advanced stages, patients who come with right-sided heart failure symptoms, they tend to have end organ damage that involves the liver and the kidney, and collaborating with hepatologists and nephrologists help us not just better risk stratify them, but also optimize them for strategies and participation in clinical trials as well. And this institution, have, being one of the earlier institutions to be involved in tricuspid valve interventions and trials, is uniquely po poised to not just to develop, refine, and produce a model for this tricuspid heart valve team that other people can emulate. The guidelines right now, the only interventions for tricuspid regurgitation are medical therapy and surgical therapy. But the goals of medical therapy stands to reason will be preload management with diuretics or sometimes dialysis as needed, optimizing left-sided heart disease, which would include valvular interventions, medical or device therapies, managing heart failure, afterload reduction with pulmonary vasodilators when indicated and prevention of treatment of end organ damage. Now, both the American Heart Failure and Valve Disease Guidelines and the European Valve Disease and Heart Failure Guidelines don't really give us much guidance with medical therapy. They mention diuretics, pulmonary vasodilators, and myronocorticoid antagonists. So it's basic, and this is all expert opinion, so it's actually left up to us to decide how we want to manage this patient, usually with the guidance of our heart failure colleagues. The American Valve Disease Guideline from 2014 and in 2017 did not address tricuspid, um, valve in, valve, tricuspid valve therapies. The indications for treatment of tricuspid regurgitation is at the time of left-sided valve interventions, or you have to wait if for for primary tricuspid regurgitation, you have to wait for RV dysfunction and severe symptomatic tricuspid regurgitation. There are no um, class one indications for surgery in primary or isolated tricuspid regurgitation, but that stands to reason because this is a really heterogeneous group and um, there are no trials available. The American guide, guideline, the European guidelines 2017 are actually similar. The, on, the only difference is that they, they make the primary tricuspid regurgitation interventions class one, but this is also based on expert opinion. So this tertiary institution in Italy decided to put this to the test. So they screened, retrospectively reviewed 12,000 echocardiograms and identified 241 patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. And if you strictly followed the guidelines of these patients, only one was an acceptable surgical risk. And of the ones who were not suitable for surgery, only 13% of them were suitable, anatomically suitable for any percutaneous intervention. And then they tried a different strategy and said, okay, what if we say everyone who has severe tricuspid regurgitation, you're going to get um, some form of intervention. With that strategy, they found that now five people had an acceptable surgical risk, and then 53% of those patients were anatomically suitable for transcatheter intervention. And this, this this now brings up the question that if we're strictly following the guidelines, are we really, are we waiting too late and is it time to revise these guidelines? We know that there's no STS data risk score for assessment of um, surgical risk for tricuspid valve and they collaborated with their surgeons and listed what was defined as, as an acceptable risk in that corner. So what are the surgical valve therapies? Is it a suture annuloplasty, ring annuloplasty? You can try to enhance coaptation replace the valve, do leaflet augmentation techniques if there's significant tethering or neocardial repair. And these are important because all transcatheter therapies basically try to mimic some form of that. Retrospective review suggests that there is improved survival and durability of repair when we do a ring repair. But there's also another observational study that suggests at least up to seven years, there was no statistically significant difference between bicuspidization and ring repair. And this kind of informs the developments that happen in transcatheter therapies. This single center study looked at about 2,800 patients, and they found that you were able to get satisfactory and durable repair with a ring, but even more so with the rigid ring. However, doing a ring annuloplasty was not um, fail-proof. 
There are certain things that predicted recurrent tricuspid regurgitation. And from the top three, it's basically really severe tricuspid regurgitation. The severe pulmonary hypertension and reduced left function basically implies that we really haven't addressed what the primary thing that caused the tricuspid regurgitation in the first place. And therefore, the repair was less likely going to be durable. And at this, if this happened, the thought is to consider replacement techniques. So if there's this decade-long um, decade information from a time-honored therapy, then why transcatheter therapies? This is an, uh, a re retrospective review of an administrative database in the United States that found that at least over 10 years, despite the fact that there was increase in the amount of tricuspid valve surgeries performed, the mortality still stayed high. Isolated tricuspid valve surgery mortality was up to 8.8%. And in another review of the same database that included an extra year, it was the same thing. Tricuspid valve repair mortality was 8.1% and replacement was about 11%. So the reason for, just, for these poor outcomes can be inferred from this single center retrospective analysis where they looked at 449 patients who underwent any kind of tricuspid valve intervention. And they found that the things that really had no impact on mortality were the procedure type or etiology of the tricuspid regurgitation. However, the things that did increase mortality, in addition to male gender and age, were NYHA4, presence of liver cirrhosis, reduced renal function, low albumin, and low preoperative hemoglobin, which again are all indicators of really advanced disease. So in fairness, basically, instead of sending patients when the leak is about this, where you actually have tools that can control this, and if you control this, you can actually rescue this house, we're sending patients with this kind of leak. And what happens is that even if with the tools that you have available, even if you're eventually able to control this leak, this house is never going to be the same and impacts outcomes. The largest registry that we have for transcatheter um, tricuspid interventions is a trivalve registry. And from this, they actually did a propensity score matching and found 268 match pairs of those who underwent tri transcatheter tricuspid intervention and those who were just treated medically. And they found that there was improved survival and increased freedom from heart failure in the patients who underwent the transcatheter valve interventions. And from the breakdown of the interventions that were used, for the most part, the mitra clip was what was available, what was used, and that's probably because it's available off the shelf. Operators were more familiar with it, and the other therapies are usually part of an early feasibility study of some sort of um, trial. The benefits from transcatheter tricuspid interventions were only to be obtained if the procedure was successful, and success was defined as reduction in the tricuspid regurgitation to less than severe. If there was procedural failure, it was not much different than medical therapy. And the risk of procedural failure was higher if there was severe RV dysfunction, again, indicating that these were patients with advanced disease. And there was no difference whether the patients were treated with a clip or other forms of therapies. So this is again to highlight that the transcatheter therapy options are actually basically replications of the surgical therapies. To better understand the challenges of transcatheter tricuspid valve interventions, we'll just briefly talk about the anatomy. The tricuspid valve is anterior, is located vertically, is larger than the mitral valve. Its size varies with late, lo different loading conditions. The leaflets are variable, the leaflets are thin. And in fact, the classically described tricuspid valve um, in autopsy-based study was only found in about 57% of patients. And they are key adjacent structures that we have to worry about. So in terms of access, the problems, the, uh, the challenges with this anatomy is that the, R, the right ventricle is complex and thin walled and therefore transapical access is not desirable. Because of the angulation between the IVC and the tricuspid valve, transfemoral access is also challenging, especially if there's a prominent eustachian valve or carry malformation. Transjugular approach can be economically challenging in the cath lab with um, the risk of possibly increasing radiation. And because of the large tricuspid valve annulus, we need really large profile delivery systems for a lot of these interventions, which of course is associated with its own attendant um, bleeding risks. From an imaging perspective, the fact that the valve is very anterior means that imaging with a TEE is challenging. 
the, esoph the esophagus is not really axial to the plane of the tricuspid valve, and therefore it's difficult to orient the probe to get a, a, a good images of the tricuspid valve. The thin leaflets makes it prone, especially since it's far from the probe. The thin leaflets tend to be obscured by the intervening left-sided heart structures. There is no tricuspid, there is rarely tricuspid and lacalcification. And that makes for challenging anchoring. In addition to the fact that the, the, because of the dynamic nature of the tricuspid valve annulus, it can be challenging to find what would be appropriate size for valve replacement options. And the thin leaflets can sometimes make it challenging for um, repair. We also have to consider the RCA and the AV node when we're doing annuloplasty or we're considering um, right valve replacement. And for all of these interventions, the trabeculations in the, in the right ventricle make, may mean that you should limit how much movement you perform under the um, tricuspid annular plane. So the first strategy for transcatheter um, valve intervention will be coaptation enhancements, which can be done with either leaflet repair or a spacer. So the mitral clip is the longest available transcatheter therapy option for the tricuspid valve in this era. And the goal of this, as with any other therapy, is to recreate coaptation. We first started out with the mitral clip, and we had to employ modified steering techniques to be adapted to the right atrium and the tricuspid valve. More recently, the Abbott Vascular has designed a clip delivery system that's specifically designed for the right atrium and allow, enables access of all the leaflets, and that's what's currently being tested in the trial. This mode of repair is impossible without echo guider, and we've already said that imaging is very difficult. Alternatives to TEE imaging will be, one, the 3D um, ice, which is available in the United States, just not yet at this institution. And some people have actually taken a pediatric probe and put it down in the right internal jugular vein to better get, um, to get better images. From a, from a clip perspective, the things that can predict failure are basically a large coaptation gap, and this is an inclusion to, this is an exclusion criteria to the current um, Triluminate study. Things like tethering area and EROE and vena contract are just a measure of severe, severity of tricuspid regurgitation, but these were specifically for, these were specifically defined for the use of the smaller clip and also for use of modified steering techniques with the mitre clip. But more recent studies will help us better define this. Again, back to that largest registry, trans, specifically for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair in that registry, procedural success was actually significant, was associated with, um, was associated with improved mortality. And there was a reduction in um, severity of tricuspid regurgitation and an improvement in NYHA class within this cohort. This is an example of a mitral clip that was performed here on the top left was actually when the patient was first diagnosed. And you can see that there's a device lead bouncing in between the tricuspid valve leaflets. That was extracted and repositioned. And after that, the patient came in for a transcatheter tricuspid valve repair. She ended up with four clips. And we can see from this transgastric image at the beginning and this one at the end, so there was significant reduction in her effective reduction in her tricuspid regurgitation without interfering with the device lead. So the early feasibility study for this strategy has demonstrated that there was it was highly successful, no intraprocedural death. There was a significant increase in the proportion of patients who had um, moderate regurgitation or less from 6% to 57%, and this was sustained up to six-month follow-up. There was also an increase in the proportion of patients who had NYHA class two or less from 25 to 80% sustained at six-month follow-up. There was at least five SLDAs, none of which required intervention, and they found that a mean gradient of five or greater was really not, didn't really have any clinical significance. They demonstrated that even with at six months, there was evidence of um, reverse remodeling on the right-sided chambers. And now the study is currently enrolling. Um, the first couple have been performed in this institution, and from what I gathered, this is the highest enrolling institution as well.
The Pascal device is not available here, and it's made by Edwards Life Science. This is basically a spacer that's attached to paddles that help, and the paddles help you attach the leaflets to the spacer. It has the ability for independent leaflet capture as well, which the new generation of MitroClip does. And the compassionate use protocol, they found that there was, they were able to get TR reduction and improvement in functional status with this. And um, no one required um, conversion to surgery. The trial for this is starting to enroll. The former device did the co coaptation enhancement by basically anchoring a foam filled cylinder to the septal portion of the RV and then anchoring it out through the vein on the skin. However, um, this is what it looks like, and it's reportedly was associated with reduced TR reduction and improved functional status, but my understanding is that the FDA has stopped this trial. So from an annuloplasty tech, um, perspective, the trial line um, is basically what that entailed is, is just basically transcatheter bicuspidization. So basically there were pledges that were posted in the posterior septal commissure and the anterior posterior commissure, and through those pledges, when you pulled, you then approximated the posterior leaflet such that the posterior leaflet that was here basically comes together and goes away and changes to it just anterior and septal leaflets. They found that there were no deaths, reduced severity of TR and improved quality of life, but there were at least three pledges, three pledges to his senses. Another trial is registered, but I don't know that that's currently enrolling. The tri cinch is the one that was performed at this institution, and basically what it entails is placing in some form of anchor out in the epicardium and then pulling with this Dacron thread until you approximate the tricuspid um, leaflets. Predominantly, you should be pulling anterior to posterior. When you've gotten the degree of um, approximation that you want, which will be measured on echocardiograms, then you can deploy an IVC stent to maintain this. The first iteration of the device in involved just a screw instead of a coil, and there were lots of um, there were hemopericardium anchor attachment associated with this, and that led to the redesign and the use of the coil. They again showed that there was reduction in severity of tricuspid regurgitation, improvement in quality of life. But well, my understanding is that the, current, the use of the current iteration in studies is, is also on hold. The minimally invasive um, annuloplasty technique, basically what that entails is that you use, is also another bicuspidization technique. So there's that anchor that is put over, that is put over the posterior leaflets, which is, tends to be the smallest leaflet. And then when that's anchored, you pull to again achieve bicuspidization. The early feasibility study was called the STAR, enrolled 10 patients, and they found, they reported no device adverse events, no dehiscence, and um, reduction in tricuspid regurgitation that was maintained out to one year. The study for this is actually getting ready to um, start enrolling. So the cardio band is a, basically a flexible annuloplasty um, repair. So it's made of a polyester sleeve that has radiopaque markers, which then have anchors about measuring about six millimeters that you, after a CT scan, you plan where you start laying out the anchors around the tricuspid valve annular plane. And when that's done, there's a nitinol wire in, between, in, in, in the middle of it that you then pull under echocardiogram and fluoroscopic guidance, then you can ascertain um, what degree of TR reduction that is required. Because of the proximity of the RCA, this should be imaged consistently during most annular um, reduction therapies, including this. And um, one of the um, reported findings is that this may be limited as a standalone therapy if there's severe annular dilation, severe leaflet tethering, and primary, and which is similar to what will has been reported for surgical literature and also for primary tricuspid regurgitation because addressing the annulus doesn't really change the leaflets. This was studied in a tri repair study which um, enrolled about 30 patients and they found um, clinically significant improvements that were clinically significant improvements in functional status and quality of life that was maintained to one year with one year survival of 83% and sustained annular reduction at um, one year. This is the only one that has a CE mark approval 
and currently starting is studying people patients in the United States. They also have a registry that is following up patients who are being done in Europe. This is still in development. So basically, um, you go through a right atrial appendage access and externally put in annuloplasty system around the tricuspid valve and then close the hole. And I, the NIH is still working to develop this in humans. Millipid iris is this complete semi-rigid ring that was designed by a surgeon primarily because the thought is that you get more durable repair with a semi-rigid or with more rigid rings. And it's only been surgically implanted in two patients. Um, it's being developed by Boston Scientific for use in the tricuspid valve space. So for orthotopic valve implantation, this can be either in the native valve or valve in valve or valve in ring. For the purposes of this discussion, I'll only talk about native valves. So the Navigate system is the only one that has been done in humans. It's basically a self-expanding nitinol stent that is approximately 21 millimeters high. And you can see that the delivery system requires about a 42 French sheath from the right IJ. There are at least some flexibility in the motion at the tip of the delivery system. It can be either trans implanted by transjugular access or transatrial access, and you need about an eight centimeter right atrial height if you're going to go transjugular. Um, so this is courtesy of Dr. Be um, Rebecca Han, but basically this is um, deployment of the Navigate system. It was done both under fluoro and echocardiographic guidance. And that's what it looks like when it's finally deployed. And it, there was like a um, near elimination of tricuspid regurgitation with acceptable gradients, as you can see on both fluoro and echo. Again, tricuspid regurgitation significantly reduced, improved quality of life, but this was used on the compassionate use protocol and 30 day mortality was as high as 13%. From if we're using surgical access, the patients who underwent surgical access had higher complications, and um, a huge proportion of the complications were due to malpositioning, either due to sizing challenges or um, canting of the valve when during um, positioning. RV perforation, again, due to the thin RV, um, happened from the guide wire. Um, pace, this patient required pacemakers. Again, the AV node is really close to this, and we tend to oversize a little to be able to implant these valves. And there were um, renal function challenges in this patient who already have CKD, and the implantation of this valve requires um, intravenous contrast, as we saw. The one couple of points are on like mitral valve, there's a low RVOT risk with this, and this is predominantly because there's no continuity in the because of the anatomy of the RVOT, RVOT and the tricuspid valve, there's no continuity between both, so you're less likely going to obstruct flow into the um, RVOT. The second thing is that even in patients who had pacemakers implanted, they were six, successfully able to do this, and it did not impact the threshold of the pacemakers as well. So this is the one that is coming to this institution. It's also a bovine pericardial valve, self-expanding night in all frame, and it has grasping points that allow for fixation. This is going to be, this institution is going to be part of some that are going to be the first to um, start the compassionate use protocol for this. The trisol valve is still in development, as well as the LUX valve, so we'll not talk about that. So some people may have heard about caval valve implantation, but that's predominantly a it was initially done as, a, as an off-label use of the sapien valve, and the goal is to reduce, you don't affect the tricuspid regurgitation itself, but what you're doing is trying to reduce the impact of the regurgitation on the liver and the kidneys. So it was first done, again, off-label use of the, of the sapien valve. Okay. However, the IVC is, can be, again, varying sizes, and this led to embolization. We can see this was, was pre-stenting. You put in the valve, you think it's anchored, and all of a sudden, it's in the pulmonary artery. 
So this actually led to early termination of this study. There were at least two valve dislocations and stem migrations, and all of those patients died. But they did find in the 28 people that they studied that there was symptom relief and quality of life improvements, but their primary outcome was a change in peak VO2, and there was no change in that. So that essentially was a negative trial, and that may just be because the RV was significantly already um, dysfunctional. So to try to overcome the problems with embolization, this Tricento came in place. And that's basically, what it is, is basically a covered stent. So it extends from the IV, SVC to the IVC, you deploy it from transfemoral, and then there's a valve that opens into the right atrium. But for this one, it's not, you can't get it off the shelf. It has to be custom made to the patient's IVC size. So there's another proposed staging system for tricuspid regurgitation, which takes what we know from uh, ACCHA guideline staging, the stage C and D, and tries to expand it further to better identify those who are potentially pro um, prohibited for any kind of intervention. And it takes into consideration both symptoms, the degree of medical treatment that the patients are requiring, and echocardiographic assessment of the grade, the annulus, and the leaflets themselves, as well as RV function. And um, the thought process is that based off of this grade, if we're, by the time transcatheter therapies are further along and better developed, we'll be able to extend these therapies to earlier patients, and again, highlights the fact that we may need um, multiple therapies for, to achieve adequate reduction in patients. So to summarize a couple of points that I want to go over, one, tricuspid regurgitation is bad. There's no going around that. And early diagnosis is key for successful therapies. The way we have the guidelines right now and the way we're approaching tricuspid regurgitation consistently, we're referring these patients late for therapies, and that may be part of why the outcomes are poor. And the first step in image on diagnosing this is careful echocardiography, and we should not hesitate to use cross-sectional imaging if there's any doubt. This institution is renowned for that and available for us to use. Transcatheter tricuspid interventions are also rapidly developing and is showing promise in early feasibility study. At least a lot of them have been shown to be safe, but we still need more, tri more studies. Another thing is standardization of outcomes. Most of the studies that I went over talked about TR reduction and NYHA class, but maybe there are other things that we should need to look for in addition to those two, also mortality, and again, like the people that looked at the peak VO2 and some other heart indicators, and also we need long-term um, follow-up. Another frontier should be when will be the best timing for intervention. Again, consistently, people are starting to find out that we're sending this patient late, and that may be the reason we have the outcomes that we do. From a transcatheter therapy options, are there, um, we need to start thinking of one therapy, not precluding the use of another therapy in this patient. And I cannot say this enough, more trials. So I'd like to thank everyone who is here today the people that have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Saraja, who has graciously shared his clinical and technical experience in the care of this patient with tricuspid regurgitation. Dr. Garcia, who um, is an excellent role model for what an early career physician should be. Dr. Mooney, who is here today, who is very insightful and has offered me good advice and help in um, the challenges that are unique to me in being an interventional and structural cardiologist. My awesome program director, Dr. Gessel, who owes me a ride in an Aston Martin. <laughs> Dr. Cavacante, who graciously shared his slides with me. Dr. Bay, who consistently, consistently gives excellent images that allows Dr. Suraja to teach me how to do this. The our cardiac surgery and cardiac imaging um, colleagues who are crucial and essential to um, our management of this patient. Marcus and Dinell, awesome colleagues that I have the pleasure and I'm blessed to work with every day. Aisha, who has shown me around the city. Um, Kate, who is also very helpful with collaborating and coordinating the care of these patients with tricuspid regurgitation. 
the MI, um, Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation research team, cath lab staff, clinic nurses and staff. I could not ask for a better set of people to work with. You guys are super awesome. And the referring cardiologists and above all our patients who are willing to participate in clinical trials that help us better define and understand what to do with patients with tricuspid regurgitation. Thank you. Questions? Okay, that's the morning. That, that was really terrific. Well, you know, there's a frantic rush of uh, efforts to address tricuspid regurg. One of the things that came out, at, at least as you went through your whole talk, was early intervention. Yet when we look at ECHOS with our colleagues, <clears throat> it's hard to come up with one thing that says, okay, this is an RV that's in transition and can be helped and should be the, pe the people that we're looking for. How close are we to understanding that, that hint point? <laughs> um, to my understanding, not quite, not quite. The problem is that with them, I mean, for in terms of echocardiogram, which is the commonest available imaging modality, the things that we use for assessing tricuspid valve, or uh, assessing right ventricular function from echo, so that we use TAPSI, which is only a measurement of one single mode, just, just a longitudinal function, or you use um, tricuspid annular um, S prime velocity, which is again just a measurement of annular function and doesn't really comprise everything. Right ventricular um, longitudinal strain is not universally available, not, has, not, not as well validated, but that's something that is laborious strain from different, it varies between different echocardiographic systems and is not consistently reproducible. The other things um, that we use fractional area change and the uh, RV ejection fraction, we can use fractional area change. Again, it, it goes back to the same problem of making sure that you get angled the probe at exactly the right point to accurately measure the right ventricle. Our um, right ventricle ejection fraction, because of the complex shape of the RV, you can't really just eyeball it and say this is ejection fraction because you can't see all of it on most of the views. And that's where you need like 3D quantification volumes to be able to tell you an ejection fraction. That's laborious. I had to do that as a general fellow for congenital patients. It's like a completely different extra reading that most busy labs will have difficulty incorporating. And that's where going the step further, since we have cross-sectional imaging, that will be maybe one way to better help identify this patient, but we're yet to completely incorporate this because beyond just technical expertise, we also have to consider the time and the reimbursement for it. Do you think the clinical trials have thoughtfully uh, targeted the preclinical, the pre-procedure evaluation to to meet their mark, or is that um, is there a consistent approach among all these clinical trials to? to qualify the patients? So most of the clinical trials for now, they're just basically um, early feasibility and just focusing on efficacy and safety. So you're basically supposed to be taking people who are not candidates for any other therapies and see if you can get some benefit from doing transcatheter interventions. We're still far away from finding out, like, is this what of our interventions that we um, end up performing? Is it durable? And does it really impact mortality beyond people feeling better? Those are things that we still don't know, but we're competing against um, surgery that has data for decades. We'll get there. Thank you. I'm, I'm really struck with the PR and kind of uh, the, how analogous it is to what we've done in chronic total occlusions. Because chronic total occlusions are bad. People have increased mortality. If you're successful in opening the vessel, you decrease the mortality. But there's this trade-off. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the criticisms in the CTO world, and I think it's, it's appropriate criticism, is that there haven't been randomized trials comparing just medical therapy to this. And so far, none of the trials have actually had any kind of a randomization. Is there any talk about that, or are the companies just going gun ho to get their product out there and sell it? So um, the Triluminate is a randomized control trial that is basically comparing um, 
transcatheter therapy with the clip versus medical therapy. But the unique thing about the design, which at least it's helpful for patients, is that patient, anyone who's, who gets enrolled in the trial will still end up getting the clip. Some people get it right away, but we need some time to compare with medical therapy and the people who are in the medical therapy arm then cross over to get the device, to, to get the clip. But that's the first one that is at least comparing the other standard of care, which is medical therapy, which, and that would have been the standard of care for people who have really prohibitive risk for surgery. There are no randomized control trials that I'm aware of that are trying to compare transcatheter valve therapies with surgical valve therapies in intermediate risk. And that's predominantly just like the evolution in aortic valves. We start from people who are really prohibitive risk for surgery and start bringing down the risk. We're still there at the beginning, like the early partner trials. And an outstanding talk and overview of uh, this topic. And I, I really like a, a couple of slides that you highlighted the importance of this being an initial time in imaging diagnosis and how can we do better because patients will not have symptoms and the symptoms are very non-specific. So rely upon us as imagers, as cardiologists to really click. But I would like you to expand on what you mentioned, that very nice slide about being a team playing sport. Uh, how do you interact with neurologists <coughs> with, you know, um, uh, nephrologists, with EP colleagues, with hepatologists, because uh, some of these patients are there, uh, and we see that we do a cardioversion and there's a lot of TR. We know that that might come back. You know, how would you propose, I mean, do you need oh, yes. more education? Do that we need to bring them in? And where does that fit our role to also educate these colleagues and do this problem? Because if it almost comes as too early, too early, too late in a week. Miss the boat. Okay, I'm trying to get to the set slide. I just wonder if it doesn't fit into the uh, our common sense understanding that AFib as a rate control strategy uh, can be uh, acceptable, yet we see AFib dilate out the yes. annuli, and then are we really, do we really have to change how we think? Because uh, Oftentimes, the only explanation we have for these large annuli are AFib, is AFib, right? And if we look closely, some of them will have substantial TR, just that we undercall and consistently. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly the slide. <laughs> so, that's a tough one. <laughs> so, um, I think the first thing is education. I'm not sure how best to do it. This is one forum to do it, but education is going to be one, um, a key portion of it, starting from not just the, the, the primary care physicians, but like you said, the people who are managing these patients with end organ damage. And we've actually gotten a couple of referrals from them recently. In addition to education, um, maybe forming focus groups, having focus groups discussion and trying to figure out like what exactly are the things that are leading to us, one, undercalling it from an imaging perspective, what are the barriers to getting these people across? Is it that our echo reports are not clear about the fact that this is um, severe tricuspid regurgitation and what should be the next steps to doing that? This is something that, I mean, is still evolving. I'm not, uh, I will be nice to better develop, but I, I don't have great answers for you, sir, sir. Yes, sir? I you and Dr. Cavill Conte. There, there's the concept of you know, how do you manipulate this medically other than diuresis mm -hmm. and the idea of the RVPA coupling and how do you assess that? Is that how do we implement that? Oh, here? Friend, have to and then the conte. Finally, what do you do about calling it appropriately as far as the severity of TR we don't? Deliver? I'll defer to Dr. Okay. Cavill Conte. <laughs> So the, the first one, the, the part about the RVP coupling, that's critical because a good RV pumping against a severe pulmonary hypertension is much different than a poor RV pumping against a severe pulmonary There has been some work on the primary pH literature that actually the volume metric, the end systolic volume of the RV divided by that stroke volume, it's a crude measurement RVP coupling. But we can and we should do more invasive hemodynamic studies to really understand where is the sweet spot. The RV tends to be short of being, you know, infarcted or other things like that, a very resilient chamber. 
So you remove some of this preload by the tricuspid vegetation, you already see some improvement in remodeling. So there's some hope, but some RVs are so far out. So we need to incorporate that, and I think a combination of both three-dimensional imaging and mode dynamics. Now your question, John, about you know, can we do better? I personally feel that, you know, I was reading echo last week. Whenever I measure, we tend, I'm trying to measure the tricuspid annulus all the time. And by the way, that requires a dedicated four-chamber <laughs> RV view. It's not the left ventricle centric <laughs> RV that we get the tricuspid. So we need to get that view. But if we try to, in every we see a little bit more than moderate, the moderate TR and tricuspid and dilation, I stopped there and said, get cross-sectional imaging or get a TD because we are at risk of underestimating. And a lot of these patients is recurrent, they fib and have path. And uh, it is a lot more TR that we're not diagnosed. So as a group, I think we should try to call into, because RV is complex, as you said, you know, and 2D does not cut it. So either we go for 3D or we go for CT or we go for CMR, or some method that we can really feel comfortable to say, this is not significant TR. How close are we, John, to have uh, an algorithm to, you know, a suggested algorithm based on an echo to further characterize the extent of RV dysfunction and suitability for further therapies. Because yeah, yeah, it need seems to, like we bake a pie each time. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we need to make this as a routine. Uh, and some colleagues, obviously, I'm very sensitive that you know, everyone has a little bit of a different approach. But systematically, I believe that this would be for the betterment of our patient care. Yes, might be a little bit more testing, but I think the stakes are high, um, and particularly when we see this patient coming with several in organ damage, where we could do a better diagnosis. It's so, you know, I, I would challenge all of you to go back to some of your patients that we see now treated with severe tricuspid regurgitation. They haven't done. <coughs> if you dial back the echoes one or two years ago, they're all severe TR. It's just that they have been undercalled. And it's just so common thing that we need to do a better diagnosis. Your statement about seeing that this is an imaging diagnosis is so critical because it is, and we have to do better. At, at what point, you know, it is a, I'll, I'll go, I'll wear a general cardiologist hat here <laughs> because, you know, I see, I was driving this weekend and I saw plenty of people with tricuspid regurgitation that scratched my head and said, well, we should recheck it after we diurese them and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But at what point should we be referring people on to more advanced, and this is, more of a question to Zhao and, and, and John, you know, at what point should we be referring people beyond the echo for evaluation of their tricuspid? And what tests should we be getting? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, again, it comes back to that being an imaging diagnosis. So beyond just saying that just whether this is severe, um, severe tricuspid regurgitation based off of um, echocardio, just based off of color Doppler or not, the, some of the things that indicate that the patient should get referred is one. I mean, if they're starting to have symptoms in the, in the hospital needing diuresis, they should get referred. If they're start, they starting to show evidence of right ventricular remodeling, large right atrium, right like ventricle, that's unlikely to go away by just preload management. And the third thing is, if you're going to get referred, I think the first step in addition to a TEE will be a T, a TTE will be a TEE. Um, it's also really challenging because up until now, the only strategies or the only therapies that were available for tricuspid regurgitation per the guidelines were really either surgery or medical therapy. So we're actually within reason treating it that way. This is just a new frontier and we're more than happy to see anybody that has, you think should be evaluated for tricuspid regurgitation. We could watch and wait and see, wait for an appropriate timing, but um, I think it's better to refer sooner rather than to wait until much later. I also think that you yeah. need to you need to really like the team shows. I, I think you know I, I believe in structural interventions. Believe me, but I just don't believe in in what we do on the tricuspid valve. I think that most of the patients will come back in one or two years with significant TR because of the further progression of yeah. dilation. Unfortunately, that's the truth, and it's always been the truth for the surgeons too, right? Mm -hmm. So we are just using the techniques that surgeons have used in the past, and they all failed, so ours will fail too, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a palliative method right now. I think to go, you have to go back five or 10 years and see who missed the boat, right? Is it the pulmonologist? didn't treat you know sleep apnea because the patient just didn't want it 
and, and so these are these examples or atrial fibrillation well let's just leave it permanent let, let's not try to remodel the atrium so all of these things I mean, this slide is really super important i think for tricuspid because yeah. we we can't deal with that annular so easily like we do with my track flippers it, it's just not it's just too much work you know too much difficulty unless someone comes up with this miraculous valve that you can deploy in five minutes and nothing happens to the rca and nothing happens ever to anything which i don't think is going to happen it's just a complicated system there we're starting to understand a little bit that, Nick, that you know, perhaps, and, and Bernardo and our group is trying to use some of the CT to inform. But it looks like that the tricuspid annulus, once it, it starts to, is an elliptical, so major minor axis mm -hmm. and everything. Once it becomes circular, that is almost the point of no return. The tricuspid regurgitation is going to improve somewhat with the diuresis, but it might not be the problem, might not be able to coap anymore. So I, I think where is that turning point when it changes the shape? When you still have some ellipsoid or you have this minor major, you still have some room to hope that this is going to improve and you're safe there. But a lot of what you said, you know, it looks better. It, that they don't require a lot to become severe again. So it's a very um, nebulous point. And it might be a false reassurance to us to say, it is looking good. If you consistently image this patient, there is not because there's so much dilation and tethering. So if I have a patient that I see in clinic and they've got moderate tricuspid regurgitation on their echocardiogram, do they, if I refer them on for advanced imaging at that point, do I just say, well, we're going to follow you serially with an echocardiogram, which I have not been doing historically because it's just a tricuspid valve, right? Um, <laughs> you know. uh, I think personally, I think there's a disconnect between our ability to treat in our ability to assess. And once the therapy gets more effective, then we need to get more refined on what we do. So what we're doing is observing the outcome more right. carefully. Right. And so hopefully one day you'll have a better option. Now, it makes me think though, are there things that we do medically that are creating the problem like pacemaker leads? And do we use micro instead or do we have a, a different way of approaching these things and do we treat atrial fibrillation earlier to avoid this? I think that's going to take large trials to understand that better. But it's leading, uh, understanding how important it is is a leading major message. What was also interesting about the teaching sessions is I think uh, Becky brings it up all the time that the tricuspid valve it, itself has usually, correct me if I'm wrong, one millimeter gradient, right? So there's a low pressure gradient throughout the venous system. Whatever we do is increasing that by 100% or more. So the whole venous system is gonna suffer from what we do. And we're trying to just improve the image. Yes, the patient will shortly have, you know, some sort of you know, benefit, hopefully. But we are increasing the venous pressure for the kidney, for the liver, and so long term, I also don't see that that's good, right? So if, if I do something like that <coughs> to a patient who then has another 10, 20 years to live, it's going to be interesting what that means, right? So if that's really an issue, it seems to be really an issue that people are concerned about. It's like three, four millimeters of mercury. It's a crazy pressure for the, for the venous system to, to deal with, they think, right? So it's a, it's a very complicated scenario to try to speak out. So, I mean, I personally believe more we have to really go back, 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 back and educate everybody part of the team and say, if there's mild to moderate uh, TR, look at your own field and make everything better. Like if FIB has to go away as possible, sleep apnea, weight loss. I mean, unless, if you get into that field of moderate to severe, severe, there's only palliation from there on. I, we'll see, but it doesn't seem like there's, when it's circular or so that, that you can do anything to that very solid structure. Great job. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Thank